thank you all for being with us today. It is my honor, my pleasure to have two Baylor lawyers joining us today to talk to us about not only the way that they practice law, but focusing specifically on client relations and how giving us some, sharing with us some tips and advice of how they have made their, their practice and their firm grow. So I'm gonna introduce uh, Josh Goldman and Aaron Von Vladeren, but I'm really gonna let them do the introduction. Um, they are both Baylor lawyers. They are both former students of mine. Um, they have become friends and I respect and admire them, not only for the way that they practice law and for the law firm, it's, it's different and unique and you're gonna hear about that, the way they've created a different way to practice law, but uh, they are just really good people good souls that I am so proud to call uh, Baylor lawyers and friends and just look forward to what incredible things they're gonna continue to do uh, in their practice and both personally. So with that, if you two would talk about sort of your journey and focusing on the way that y'all, why, why was it so important that you think about the practice of law in a, in a way that's a little bit different than perhaps your, um, than others do it, let's say, let's just put it that way. Sure, I'll kind of introduce myself. Um, I'm Josh Fogelman. Um, I graduated from Baylor Law in 2008. Um, I, I did a litigation cornerstone here since that was something that I was always interested in from a very young age. Uh, following graduation from law school, I uh, did a uh, clerkship at the Texas Supreme Court, which was phenomenal before joining a general practice law firm in 2009, um, where I worked for about five years, uh, a part of which was alongside Aaron. And then Aaron and I founded the law firm Fogelman and Von Flatern, which we go by FBF Law in Austin in 2014. Um, so we just celebrated our eighth birthday here. Uh, and, and I'll let Aaron talk more about this, but uh, you know, when Aaron and I decided to start the law firm together, he and I were like-minded in what kind of a mission uh, we wanted to accomplish and what we wanted to put out into the world as far as values of our organization, what we wanted to give to people, what we wanted to give to the community, um, and particularly in the personal injury arena, uh, which was you know, a notoriously challenging atmosphere as far as public trust and community trust. Uh, so uh, when we started the law firm, uh, being transparent, being honest, being forthright, and being uh, good stewards of our law license were of fundamental importance to us. And um, you know, we really sh strove to be leaders in our community in helping remove maybe some of the cloud over a very important and very valuable uh, area of practice um, in, in our state. Yeah, so I also uh, I wanted to thank you, Professor Teague, for having us here. My name is Aaron Von Flader, and um, <clears throat> Professor Teague is one of the first people I met at Baylor Law School, and I have always admired her ability to hold herself to a really high standard. You guys have probably noticed that as well, and I think that's the like where I would start in my education is just sort of look at someone who's doing it right and trying to do it that way. Um, we're not here to give you the kind of advice that's um, you know, going to change your life or anything, but I think it's great to probably hear from practicing lawyers who are doing it a little differently. We uh, tried to, as Josh said, create our own path in the personal injury world, which had uh, done itself no favors in the way it marketed to people and the way it messaged to regular humans in our community. And what we saw was there was this uh, choice people were having to make, which is, do I trust like this insurance company or this corporate defendant who's, who I've got a case with to, to, to settle properly with me? Or do I go hire some you know, billboard lawyer that I don't really feel very comfortable with, right? So what we saw was an opportunity there. If, if we could have a sort of uh, a humane practice that reached out to people, regular people in a regular way and communicated, look, we're people too. We have families in the community. We uh, think there's a lot of value and giving people advice on what is sometimes the most complex and largest transaction of their lives. You know, a lot of people are coming into buying a home and they hire a real estate agent and they don't think anything of that. But when they come to hiring a personal injury lawyer on a case that, you know, could potentially 
dramatically alter the path of their lives, they will often say, I'm not that kind of person. And it, it should be alarming to us as lawyers when uh, people are out there saying that about lawyers, right? Like, I'm not that kind of person to what? Get informed, right? Like, so we, we saw that. We said, okay, well, let's try to practice differently. And we got lucky in the sense that we started at a time when the internet, the great equalizer, started to publish online reviews of what lawyers were doing. You know, before that, it was a black box. And it was, if you had a million dollars a year to spend on, on TV ads, you could practice personal injury law. And we came around right at the time where, hey, if you actually made your clients happy, they'd write you reviews that people cared a lot more about than those billboards. And, and we grew our practice from there. Um, and I, I think in that desire to make each of our clients, you know, quote unquote, five star happy, we found it worked a lot better if you really could dig deep and connect with them as humans and empathize with them the way you guys are learning in this class. You started just the two of you. Tell us how you've grown your, your firm and then very importantly, how do you orient, how do you onboard new lawyers to see the practice of law in the way that you do? And so how do you explain to them? So what are those core values? What principles are really important to you that you want to make sure each of your new lawyers, as well as all of your staff, uh, exhibit in the way that they practice and uh, relate to clients? I'll take the first half. Yeah, so when we started, it was just Aaron and I, and we were actually borrowing a paralegal half time. Um, we were fortunate to start with a decent docket of cases, and we realized very quickly, fortunately, uh, that the message that we were putting out into the community was reverber reverb reverberating positively. We were getting a lot of positive feedback, and our phone started ringing because we were getting five-star reviews on everything that we did because we put customer focus and customer service at the absolute forefront of our business from day one. Aaron and I were fielding phone calls at every hour of every night of the week, you know, disrupting time with our family in order to make sure that people in crisis mode were uh, being attended to timely. Um, and that response generated a lot of interest in working with us, and so we began to grow. And we grew actually pretty rapidly. Uh, you know, there was a, it could be said that we grew too rapidly for some period of time, but we just had to, the work had to get done, and we had to be able to carry the load. So we've learned a lot from that, but where we are now, um, we have about 12 lawyers and a team of about 30 people, um, case managers, paralegals, attorneys, um, <laughs> marketing people, um, a, whole, a whole family of like-minded people that are, help, uh, that are along on this ride with us, on this journey with us. Yeah, I think getting to your question about you know, how we're onboarding people and how, what values we're putting into them, uh, we used to, to tell people in interviews, like, look, if you're going to work here, you have to be the kind of person who's willing to take out the trash, no matter who you are, because Josh and I do that. You know, it's like we, we might clean the bathroom or whatever it was, um, and it wasn't just that we needed help pitching in on everything. It was we needed a service mindset. You know, we need we needed people that looked at the practice of law as a calling, as a way to serve, as something that is uh, can be very personally meaningful. Uh, only through service, you know, and if, if you're in service of your own ego and you like that piece of paper and you hang it up and, and you, and you kind of hide behind it, um, it can give you some comfort for a while, but eventually uh, you'll be asking yourself, why am I doing this? Why am I practicing? And so uh, we tried to set a course that was based on empathy, customer service, and we made sure as we grew that it wasn't just lawyers that were getting that message. You know, our uh, receptionists, uh, the paralegals, the, the people that were just helping us with filing, uh, we wanted them to know that, you know, we see this as a place, a, a platform of, of purpose, and not purpose like save the world, kind of, you know, that kind of stuff. More like, you know, you show up for your teammates first and foremost. You know, you have to have a reason to jump out of bed in the morning and want to come here. And, you know, so then it was like, 
okay, well, also you can serve clients. You can get them from this extremely troubling situation to a light, you know, higher ground. Um, and that's very satisfying, of course, and we can all do that as a team. And so, you know, we kind of rallied around that. But then we, we really wanted them to see that if we do this right, you know, we can actually change the perception that people have of this work, and we could change the way our competitors are approaching it, and we could change the outcomes for people that we don't even have as clients. You know, because if, if there's more accountability in our practice, generally, if that becomes the standard, and remember, the Internet's the great equalizer, and everything's transparent now, uh, you know, if that can become the standard, it's going to serve everybody. And so in a small way, you know, you're making an improvement whether you're the lawyer doing closing argument or the receptionist who's just making someone who just lost their loved one feel comfortable. Yeah, I love to hear the language that you use because, you know, hopefully that's what we at Beta Law are all about, being service-oriented, trying to find an area of practice that is meaningful for you. So you are brave to have left the comfort of the positions that you had to embark upon this new journey. So um, tell us about that. What, was there a, just a moment in time you said, okay, this is it. We've got to do it differently. And we're willing to leave the comfort of the positions we have to start trying it a new way. And um, did you have some doubts along the way? So, you know, we learn often from our struggles and our failures, so help us be a little vulnerable with us and share with us what that journey was like. Yeah, so I would say that you'll find yourselves when you get out into the practice of law, you're going to find yourselves uh, having a despair. There's going to be a broad disparity of knowledge and skill between you and the people who are coming to you and relying upon you for advice. People are very vulnerable, not, not because they're weaker than you, you're just an expert in this particular field and you've got this license that entitles you to do all sorts of these things and you've studied and you've practiced and they haven't. So they're relying on you for advice. <clears throat> in the personal injury field in particular, um, people can be taken advantage of very easily. You're talking about oftentimes amounts of money that are unfathomable to people that are coming to you for advice. They don't, they don't really conceptualize what the end game in their case might look like. And you also have a pretty significant financial interest in helping bring them across the finish line. It's just the nature of that industry. There's also a lot of kind of sick, there's a, a cyclical aspect to the practice of personal injury law. You're not billing hourly. You don't have a lot of guaranteed income coming in all the time. And so you can find yourself in a position where you've got cases that might not be ripe to be resolved, but you might have bills that you have to pay. And you have to make a choice about, well, do I stand firm to my values in this organization and endure the stress of maybe having to uh, wait a little while for some more money to come in the door? Or do I settle some cases prematurely and pay the bills and my clients will be none the wiser to that? Um, and and I, I had some exposure uh, just in the industry in general seeing that happen um, at a pretty, pretty early point in my career and watching how the industry was taking advantage of people and how some reputable people uh, in the industry were handling those decisions in a way that was harmful to the clients. So at that point I realized it personally, I want to do things differently than that. People deserve to have things done differently than that. People deserve to be treated with dignity and respect and they're placing their trust in you and you deserve to do the honorable thing and act with integrity all the time. Um, so that was sort of conceptually for me what put me in that position. And then in 2013, actually, Aaron and I were working together in 2013. Uh, we were working uh, in some pretty interesting cases, on some pretty interesting cases and stressful cases together not for the same law firm, but under the same umbrella in the same office with some joint ventured cases. And within the matter of literally 10 days, my dad passed away suddenly and unexpectedly, and then Aaron's boss and one of my major mentors, and Aaron's major mentor, passed away suddenly and unexpectedly. And that, at least for me, put me in a position of taking a step back and thinking, 
well, what do I really want out of life in general? What's my mission? Where am I going to get my purpose? And to your point, yeah, it was terrifying because you come from a situation where you've got a, a constant paycheck and a lot of security, um, but it's not really fulfilling you. And you know you have to take this risk, and it involves taking a leap of faith, and it's terrifying because you don't know if you're going to jump and fall. Um, but fortunately, you know, I had Aaron alongside with me, and he's the best partner anyone could ever ask for, for a, a reasons I could go on and on for hours about. But we took, the, we took the, the leap together, and fortunately for us, it's worked out, and it's been, frankly, like the greatest decision of my life, I would say. Yeah, was, <clears throat> great answer. And I'll just briefly say, for me, it was a slow drip. Uh, understanding that not all lawyers are practicing the right way. And when you get out, you look up to everybody, right? Like they've got their law licenses. They've, they've been doing it for maybe 20 years. And <clears throat> as you start to witness them doing things, you start to notice like, wait, I spent all this money going to law school. I spent all this time. I nearly like lost my home trying to get that degree. Am I really going to practice that way? You know, and so it just sort of starts to seep into your bones. It's like, no, I got I to do something different. And for me, I had a child. Our kids are almost exactly the same age. And so, you know, we had babies when we started the law firm. And it was terrifying uh, to not know when you were going to get paid. And honestly, that was also a privilege, the fact that we had the means to be able to do that. You know, I, I came personally from a background that, that didn't even have that. Like, you couldn't take that risk if you wanted to. And so part of it is just noticing that, like, hey, I don't care who you are. If you're in this room, you probably have had quite a bit of privilege in your, in your life. And I th think it's a dishonor you know, it's, if you don't recognize it and do something with it, right? So that was, that was kind of what led me to say, I want to practice the right way. And, um, and then, of course, there are all these temptations. But as I said, you know, when, when the whole world looks at your online reviews, it starts to keep you really, really honest. <laughs> you know, you're going to do a good job every time, or everyone's going to know. So. You know, I was privileged to work for a very reputable law firm. I had great mentors, but I had the realization about three, four years in, I had been advoca advocating, advocating, is that right? Advocating, giving up, there we go, giving up to the partners to the ethics committee to make decisions for me without me thinking about, is this the right thing to do? Is this the right approach? So, again, fortunately, I had really good mentors. And so when I look back and did that analysis, okay, everything we did, everything I did was all good. But as a young lawyer, it's so tempting to sort of let somebody else tell you how to practice. So it's interesting. It's, it's about that three to four to five years out, is that about? Similar? Yeah. Exactly right, yes. Yeah. So let's, um, let's jump forward now. Um, and I just have to add that one of our biggest problems in this profession is the, the, the wellness, the mental wellness of our lawyers. And so, again, for y'all to, to have the, the bravery to step out of, uh, of a position or a practice that didn't really fit in the way that made you feel whole. So many get stuck and feel like they can't do that. So that's just you know, quite, uh, quite brave of you and just admirable of you. So now let's jump through and um, jump ahead to now talk about the joys of now that you're, uh, I know you're not where you want to be in terms of the things that you want to accomplish, but I assume we sort of turned that corner. And so talk about the joys of the practice of law in the way that you've designed it. And um, we, we've talked about client-centered approach, exactly what we do. Talk to our students about why that's been such an important decision that you made, and now that you're on the less scary side, although as owners and entrepreneurs, never completely gone, that, that fear, that concern, because now it's not just the two of you. How many other families are relying upon the two of you and your leadership? Yeah, quite a few. But, so that's a tremendous responsibility. Talk about the joys of doing it this way. And kind of to your point of the mental health aspect yeah. of the practice of law, you should be under no illusion that with this license carries a very, very heavy burden. It's unlike many other professions 
in that you can't leave it at the office. You're dealing with other people's like most profound problems. In many situations, uh, it'll be maybe the most challenging thing that they're ever going to go through their, in their lives and they're trusting you with it. And you, you got to take that home and you got to keep your composure and it'll wear on you. <clears throat> um, but the joy of the practice, at least the joy that I have found in the practice of personal injury law and specifically at the organization um, that I am you know, grateful to be a part of, uh, is you really get to do something positive for people. I mean, really, you're changing people's lives. They're coming to you in a dark tunnel. They don't understand the path forward. They have no real clue what an outcome looks like. And at the end of the day, uh, there have been many situations where you have changed their lives in a meaningful, meaningful way. Um, Aaron, you know, we've got specific stories that we could share with you, but the beauty of that, when you get to do it time and time again, and, and obviously it's a spectrum, you know, some cases are small, some cases are massive, um, some injuries are small, some injuries are catastrophic. Uh, but regardless, you're doing something positive, and it's not just great to be a part of accomplishing that and truly helping somebody else who's trusted you and getting to feel what that's like at the end when you're hugging each other and you've brought closure to their lives and you've done something really positive. But that reverberates throughout the entire organization. Everybody that has their thumbprint on the file, whether it be from client intake to helping cut the checks at the end and closing the file down and everywhere in between are touching the lives of the people that we're helping and we become bonded with them forever. And we hear that from, our, from the members of our organization over and over and over again as why they stay because doing this brings a purpose to one's life. And if you read any wellness book about mental health and uh, finding your way, purpose for existence is a pervasive theme. You're always going to hear that time and time again. And you know, sitting here, having been in the practice of law for 15 years and seen many, many ups and downs uh, in my life professionally and personally, I, I can just attest to the importance of that. And everyone, I hope, should understand that while having a law license does bring a lot of stress to life, if you allow it to, it can also bring you a tremendous amount of joy. Yeah, I'll, when you're in a client relations class, <clears throat> it can kind of seem like you're just sort of uh, an output, the client is the input, they're gonna tell you what their priorities are, and it's your required sworn duty to put those priorities over your own. And so the idea of a values-based practice can, can seem kind of like incongruent with that. And I think what we're trying to communicate is you actually do have some choices, right? Like you can set some boundaries and, and get yourself a framework, uh, even if you're an employee, right? Like you don't have to own the law firm to have some boundaries. Uh, you can set some boundaries with yourself, you know, basically like I don't want to practice that way. Um, you can start to build on the things that you know you like and through mastery and through excellence you go where you want to all right you control the path of your career and if and if something is a downer for you or it just doesn't feel right get good at the thing that makes you feel good you know and that's what we're saying not everyone's going to practice personal injury law not everyone's you know going to have that high five we've got i've got three kids that i I mean, no, not my kids. There's three kids that I'm aware of in existence right now whose colleges are paid for because of a case that we worked really hard on that no one would take. And the two parents are dead, and these kids have had just, you can't even imagine how bad their start is in life. It's as bad as you can you know, just possibly imagine. And if I'm having a crummy day, I can think about the fact that we did something for those kids. It's permanent. You know, everybody who works at the car wash probably finds some purpose in their lives. They get up, they high five each other, let's get this car out the door, but they're gonna forget about it the next day. Like, what car did we wash? I don't know. You know, this work is permanent, or it can be, and 
that's really exciting, you know, if you, if you start to tap into that um, and just follow your path, you know, the way it, it needs to go. Wow, that is just such a powerful testimony for the impact that we as lawyers, the privilege that we have, but also the awesome responsibility, obligation to represent clients, and especially those that, uh, that have a need. It's so often that our beta lawyers talk about those really heart-wrenching, difficult, tough cases that are the most meaningful. So thank you for sharing. Talk to us about um, what it looks like to bring a new client in. So what, how does that look different in your, in, in your opinion from intake at others and then sort of all the way through building um, the relationship with the client? Kind of what are the basic steps? Because you know, we, we spent time on that initial interview. So how, does that look different? If so, what, what recommendations, what advice do you have for for our students, and then what about building on that to nurture that relationship as it goes forward? Sure, I can talk about the the initial sort of intake and the importance of that, and you can handle the rest. But, uh, you know, my frame of reference is somewhat limited because I haven't worked for a lot of other organizations um, to understand what their intake processes are like. But I have talked to hundreds if not thousands of people who we might be their third or fourth call and nobody before them would give them the time of day because their case, you know, at, at first glance didn't merit their time. Um, so really early on uh, in founding the firm, we decided that one of our goals in any initial client contact was to do something to help them. Um, we know that they're calling us and they're confused. Sometimes they're calling us and they're frustrated because they can't get answers. So one of our sort of main missions is to help people make informed decisions. And so what that means for us is providing the education that we can, when we can, regardless of how much of our time that's gonna take even knowing in many circumstances that this is not going to evolve into an attorney-client relationship because the case isn't one that's a proper fit for our law firm. But what we seek to do is help to at least explain as best we're able what the client's rights and options are, help let them uh, express their concerns to us, express their fears to us, and help allay those concerns and allay those fears and help them understand that there is a path forward. Um, and, and that's a lot easier to do, of course, in the types of cases that we're experts in. Most of the personal injury cases, you can, you can give them the entire framework of how does the tort system work in Texas? I can do that in 30 minutes now, um, pretty, pretty handily. Get a solid uh, B plus. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Esri would give me an A minus, especially if I went into res ipsa loquitur. Anyway, so but but there are a lot of uh, a lot of clients that call us, and we know that we're not going to handle their case, but we will help them understand. Hey, listen, this is the type of lawyer you need. This is what you should be looking for. These are the questions that you should be asking, and if we have the opportunity to refer them to someone. We will gladly do that. And I would say, in fact, like on that point, um, we have built up a pretty extensive referral network of lawyers in various practice areas. In order to make that initial client consultation better, it's hard. It's hard. Like people call with these one off questions, and it's just so far out of left field for what you're used to hearing or, or catches you so off guard, you don't really know what to do and it can be paralyzing. And so one of the most difficult things that we've done, I would say, is trying to identify other members in the legal community that can handle those various aspects of the law and, uh, and, and be able to off, uh, off ramp those clients and get them some help. But yeah. making sure that you're making sure that you're listening to them and hearing them. What what is on your mind right now? Get it off your chest. It can be hard because you have to manage them. Sometimes clients will want to monopolize your time. They just don't know what's relevant, and what's not relevant, and working to sort of make sure that you're having a productive conversation and an efficient conversation can be really challenging. And it just takes 
practice and taking swings and doing it over and over again and getting comfortable in your own skin, but, but really listening to them and hearing what they have to say and what they want to know uh, is, is something that we, we focus on. Yeah, I'd say most law firms are approaching new clients as, uh, you know, do we want them or not? If we don't, how do we get rid of them? If we do, how do we capture them, right? Like that would be the typical com you know, approach for law firms with new clients. And what we try to do is, is, as Josh said, provide somewhat of a service knowing that if we're useful to them, they're gonna wanna hire us. We don't need to try that hard. Um, <clears throat> and if, if we get good at talking to them, we can, we can spend not that much time getting them better off than we found them. Um, a lot of times, uh, if, if you, if you're not used to talking to new clients, it can take maybe three hours. You just like you look up and you're like, oh, "What did the day go? I'm still talking to this person about an area of law I don't even know." Uh, but once you get uh, kind of action oriented with clients, and you always should be, um, and you start to say, "I don't know exactly what's going on here, but I know there's some steps we can all take to go forward." Right? Like, you know what? I'm gonna look up this thing you're talking about so I get better oriented. And I'm going to call a lawyer I know who's in this area, and I'm going to get back to you as to whether there's another lawyer who can help you or if, if there's more to be explored here. So in 10 minutes, you, you know, you've taken a three-hour conversation and just sort of directed it. So, so learning how to direct clients through that sort of action-oriented posture, you know, just practically, that would really save you a lot of time in your practice. Yeah, we've talked about law school does a really good job of, of forcing you to listen, but so often you're listening with the intention of being able to respond. And so we've talked a lot about listening for purposes of understanding, listening for purposes of figuring out kind of what are the next steps, not, not about me, but about the other person. So did you find that to be the case starting off, and at what point do you think you got better at it. I would say starting off was challenging because you really are trying to understand how you're going to feed your family. And so you're listening and you're like, oh, this is a great case and I really want to sign this case. I can do great work for them. We can really do something here. But I don't want to be over eager because this conversation is not about me. This conversation is about them. Um, and the more you get comfortable in your own skin and realize that people are calling you because they've, they've already done their homework and you're already validated in your mind. Most of the time, clients aren't calling to vet who we are. They're calling because we've already been vouched for and they've already done their homework and they've already made the decision that we're the people for them. And unless we do something untoward on the phone call uh, or don't answer the phone, like, if there's an opportunity for us to work together, that's going to happen. But it takes time to develop that confidence and, uh, and, and, you know, really make sure that when you're feeling those phone calls that you're focusing on listening to what they need to hear out of that conversation versus, like, what you want to tell them out of that conversation. If, if you are an especially empathetic person, one of the hazards of that is that when someone tells you that they've lost a loved one, you, you kind of want to flip into how do I make it better? How do I help them grieve? You know, how do I get, walk down this path with them emotionally? And uh, one of the things that I came to learn was that you have to respect the fact that they have a family, they have friends, they have a church to go to. They called you for a specific plan of action to, for help with what can be helped, not the part that you can't help with and aren't qualified to help with and they haven't asked you to help with. And so it just takes a, a little bit of a step back for yourself to say, okay, this person's crying, but they need to just cry and I need to just sit here. And it's tough, but especially as lawyers, because <laughs> we want to talk. But, um, but I think that is a, a, a good lesson to learn. Just some practical tips about maybe protocols you have, procedures, to make sure that you are being attentive to the client along the way. And we also talked about having kind of a network of lawyers you can refer to in those situations where they're sitting there and they're sad. Do you, because we've also talked about you may need to refer them to counseling. So 
just more advice and, and practical tips of generally and then in some specific difficult situations, things we might think about. Yeah, so, uh, you know, lawyer referral service, if it's just you have no freaking clue what they're talking about, is, is a good one to know. Uh, 475 help in Austin is one where you feel like someone might be in danger. Um, you know, the, you kind of get a toolbox full of things that are, that are adequate responses to the things that are just, you know, challenging uh, beyond the lawyer's regular toolbox. Um, but usually, like every other question in the law that's hard, the answer is communication and collaboration. You know, get your peers involved, communicate with the person, and find out what their issue is. I mean, I took a call one time from someone who was clearly in, in some sort of, you know, shady hotel, and the story involved aliens, and it was just, I mean, the person was terrified. It wasn't like they were calling, this prank calling me, like they were terrified. And I was, you know, I didn't have any idea how to respond to this as a lawyer, except to sort of ask, you know, is there someone in your life that checks on you? Do you have a caseworker? And through that process, we kind of got directed to a person who was better equipped to help. And so, um, you know, these are human reactions. These aren't really lawyer reactions, but you learn to incorporate those into your legal practice uh, in order to have uh, the best possible practice. One of the things, too, is <clears throat> there's a, there are a lot of client phone calls that you get where the initial conversation just opens the door to a bunch of follow-up work. Like, I'm not sure that I'm the right lawyer for you. I'm not sure if I'm gonna be able to help you. I'm not sure if you have a case. So it's really hard to put together a definitive action plan at that time. You need to go and gather more information. But something that I've tried to incorporate in that we have sort of as a theme in our whole entire uh, intake process is making sure that when we're on the phone with the client or meeting with the client, we're very clear about what the next steps are. I mean, definitive action plans. Here's what I'm gonna do. Here's what I need you to do. Once you have done that and once I have done this, we're gonna reconvene in this manner and we're gonna determine the best path forward. And I think that uh, helping to direct some of the energy that you get from the client when they're, when they're lost, uh, helping to direct it into some concrete decision making can be really useful. And it, I, I think you're, you, you, you establish rapport at that time that, hey, I'm here, I'm listening, we're gonna get something sorted, we can't do it today, but I promise we're gonna get you there and to make sure that you do a good job of following up. I know that, you know, and this opens up the door to a larger conversation, but my understanding is that, you know, the most lawyers get sanctioned by the bar for lack of client communication. And I, I will tell you what's interesting about client relations, so people are so different. Like you get some clients that are ding in your inbox daily and you get some clients who will sit back and do nothing waiting to hear from you to tell them what to do. So establishing a protocol within the law firm to have a, uh, a consistent and repeatable method for making sure that communication is constantly flowing back and forth from you to your client so that everyone remains on the same wavelength and resentment doesn't build and opportunities aren't missed and deadlines aren't missed. That's critical. It's critical for, for maintaining client happiness and for maintaining your own sanity in the practice. Yep, setting standards is key. You know, how often are you gonna call your clients? Um, every practice is gonna be different, but you need to have a standard that you keep for yourself. Um, and then also that you communicate to your help because hopefully as you develop in your practice, you're gonna have lots of help, be it paralegals or case managers. Um, you're, you're gonna have a team. It might be several lawyers that you're managing. Um, there needs to be standards for everybody that's, that's clearly communicated. Uh, for client follow-up, frequency over depth, I would argue every time. 
uh, someone who calls their client once every three months and has a two hour long conversation with them might be doing an amazing job, but I promise you that is not as good as calling them every week for 20 minutes. Um, so just, just think about the way you can incorporate frequency over depth because it, it rapport is a weird thing. Like we don't, there's no uh, formula for it, but we know it takes time. You know, you can't just say, okay, well, this is our three hour rapport session. I'm gonna get to know you, you're gonna get to know me, we're gonna be best friends, you know. It happens over time. So you need multiple contacts with your clients to make it work. Something that's also kind of difficult to lose sight of, you know, you might be managing 40 or 50, I don't know, you, you, you might be handling a bunch of different cases. And to you, <clears throat> you know, you know that you're touching your file every day. You know that you're doing what you need to be doing in order to pushing the case forward. Your client though, each of those clients, what you're handling for them is probably the biggest thing that they have going on in their lives. And it can be easy to get lost in the shuffle there and just assume, hey, I'm not hearing anything from them, therefore they're happy. I assure you that is not the case. I assure you that is false. They want to hear from you and they deserve to hear from you um, because they need to know what you're doing. They need to at least know that you're thinking about them. They want forward movement. They deserve forward movement. So understanding and developing a way to make sure that you're doing that, even if they don't ask you to, make sure that you're doing that is uh, definitely good practice. Let's pause now and open up to questions. Who's got a first question? Sure. Uh, so, so the question is, what do you, how do you handle cases where you might have multiple different claimants in the same incident and there might even be some finger pointing between them? So there's, there's kind of two aspects to that. I, I can give you an example. I, I recently handled a case with a group of coworkers that were visiting Austin from California and they were in an Uber and they got hit by a drunk driver and they all got hurt and went back to California and you know one of them left their job and they sort of dispersed. And it can be really challenging when you're dealing with multiple claimants. One family is typically easier. Um, they're all generally gonna be aligned. You're generally gonna be able to communicate uh, fairly effectively with you, they, they might choose one person in the family to sort of take the lead, but, but getting them together can be easy. Some situations are just not easy. Um, this situation was very challenging. Some of the clients were very easy to get a hold of. Some of the clients were very hard to get a hold of. And what can become really difficult is when you have one or more of your clients that are compliant and really helping to move the case forward but the success of that case is dependent upon one of the other clients or some of the other clients who might be less compliant. What do you do to jumpstart the situation? And I think a lot of it, like anything else in life, is setting and managing expectations. And there, you know, I wouldn't be afraid to sit down with a client who might be problematic in a manner that's impacting the other people's cases and establishing very clear boundaries and stating, listen, your failure to respond and communicate to us is causing problems, not just in our relationship, but in this relationship between me and the other clients. And if you can't do the things that you have agreed to do in the agreement that we have, we're going to have to part ways. That can be difficult. It's difficult to have confrontational communications with people like that. 
but I have just found over time that the better job you do of establishing expectations and establishing boundaries early on, the easier it is to hold people accountable for delivering what they stated that they're, they're going to deliver. The other aspect of that is, and this is maybe in the nuance, a little bit nuanced beyond the scope of this conversation, but you have to be aware of conflicts of interest. That happens. Uh, that, I mean, that could have been a very, a very unique situation where you know, you've got friends in a car and one of them is driving and they caused the crash partially or they were drinking and all three of them want to come hire you. You have to have some really difficult conversations and say, listen, I can't represent you because I need to sue you. And, and sometimes you just have to do that. Yeah, so I, I would add you know, managing expectations is key, and, and also obviously complying with the law is key. There are laws, that are, we, have, we have standards in our profession that we've set for ourselves about conflicts of interest. We, uh, fortunately, in our firm, we have a former Supreme Court clerk who wrote the part of our contract that's the longest part of our contract, by the way, about conflicts of interest, and it gives a clear roadmap to the potential client to say, look, if, this, if there's going to be a conflict, here's how it's going to break down. And um, you understand these are the risks of multiple client representation. There are many efficiencies to be gained. So you, you share expert costs. A lot of times you win the same hearing. You, know, you don't have to have multiple hearings on the same discovery issues. Um, you, can, you, you streamline the costs of the case. You streamline the speed of the case often by hiring one lawyer for like a carload of people. It, it, it's a lot of value to be added weighed against the possibility of a conflict of interest. Um, so as long as they understand what they're agreeing to, it's usually fine. A lot of times when there's like multiple wrongful death beneficiaries of a single death, uh, we outline for them, listen, there are, there's gonna come a time where the family has to decide how to split the money. You know, maybe the sister was a lot closer to this person and some dependent upon this person, maybe merits more money than the brother. But as lawyers, we are not going to wade into that. You're going as a family to have to decide that amongst yourselves and tell us what the split is. You know, and the court, of course, will oversee that in a lot of these cases. The court makes sure that like minor children are protected, that the parents aren't taking all the money. Uh, you know, there's a lot of oversight for these things. But the key is communication and setting expectations. We've heard that before. Setting expectations and managing your client's expectations. Who's got another question? I can do it. Uh, I think I have one going. That, the, you got it. Okay, I'll talk to you. Uh, so kind of back to the start of when you jumped off and started the firm. Um, how did you go about getting clients in the door initially? Because understand now it seems like your practice is reputation based. You can kind of point back to, hey, look what we've done here. Um, how did you go about getting clients in the door at the outset when you didn't have that reputation? And obviously, you, know, you mentioned you didn't really want to get into the TV ads because it's a hey, budget issue, it beats the stigma and, and confusion that can come with that. Um, how did you go about initially marketing yourselves? Yeah, we're fortunate to have started with a docket of cases that we were already working on with the prior firm, came to an agreement with them that was fair, uh, and, and it was a really amicable split. This gave us a small toehold enough to like if we worked hard we could produce revenue and then with the revenue we were careful in uh, going after I guess you would say traditional investments in marketing on the, the you know, SEO internet stuff uh, but also community investment so if you want to be a firm that reaches out to your community then it's a good idea to get involved in the things the community cares about and so we have participated as volunteers as well as you know donated to like a dozen different uh, causes and we started early with what tiny amount of money we had and we kind of kept growing that fortunately uh, Josh had I think gotten some like Yelp reviews uh, as, a, as his own like law practice and so we had the, the sort of the good fortune of having you know, when everyone kind of scoffed at the idea of a, a lawyer being reviewed on Yelp, you know, there we were. And when people didn't trust the other review services at that time, they were trusting Yelp. And so that helped a lot. Yeah, I was just as a consumer, 
an early adopter of Yelp and other review-based platforms, and I sort of recognized that, well, why should the practice of law be any different? Why shouldn't people be able to, you know, tell the world what their experience was like? They should do that. That should be a tool that keeps people honest, maybe even especially in this industry. Uh, so we, we leveraged that really hard, and we encouraged you know, that kind of feedback, positive, negative, and otherwise. Uh, and that was actually useful in a number of ways. One, it, it generated interest and got the phones ringing for us because there was a very long time. In fact, we probably still are the number one lawyers on Yelp in, in, uh, in Austin. But that kept the phones ringing for a long time, but it also helped shape the mission and the, uh, the, the philosophy of the organization as a whole. How do we keep this going? How do we use this tool to make ourselves the best version uh, that we can be of ourselves? But also, you know, something that should never be overlooked when you're starting a new law firm is just networking. You know, particularly in the personal injury world, I don't know if it's like this in, in other practice areas, but there's a really robust community of trial lawyers in all of the major cities, and then there's an umbrella uh, organization in the state <clears throat> where it's a list serve, essentially, uh, where people communicate with one another, and it's a very supportive community. So we, you know, we were we have been involved in that community from the very beginning. We have established really good working relationships with other lawyers of other kinds. In fact, there was a time when I was getting on Yelp and looking at other lawyers in different practice areas who had also achieved really high reviews from their clients. And I thought, hey, look, if these are the types of people that are going to provide this level of customer service to people. These are the people that I want to send our prospective clients to, and let's go meet them. I would just cold call them and go and have lunch with them. Um, and you know, over time, if you're doing good work and you have a good reputation, people, people will come to learn that in the community, and they'll come to support that. It can be challenging at first, of course, because when you're just starting, you don't know where you're your next paycheck's coming from. And so it's hard to be selective about the cases that you bring on, and you have to sort of earn your stripes in the community. Um, but that's kind of part of the rite of passage, and it comes with so many other benefits as well. But just putting yourself out there, really. And how do you be, one of your principles is to educate the public. And being strategic in terms of getting involved in the community is an important, uh, uh, you know, goal you should have as well. So how do you put those two together and be strategic in using opportunities to educate, knowing that that's going to get your name out there, you're going to create these networks and opportunities, specific examples or advice? So I would say uh, it's cheesy, but like follow your heart, right? So if you, um, you know, I'm, I'm a little league dad, so I'm on the board there and you know, we love live music in Austin and we connected with the HAM organization. That's probably our biggest organizational partner um, and, you know, we, Josh had lost a loved one and it was very traumatic and we connected with the Christie Center, which is one of those centers for families who are grieving and, and, you know, basically like did yard work for them. We, you know, there was, even if we didn't have the money to pay, we could go do something for them. The Humane Society, I mean, who doesn't like bathing puppies, right? So we went and did that and gave them money when we had the money. Um, and just the things that personally interested us there's so many worthy causes and what we find at the top of all these organizations that you've heard of is there's like somebody who's the executive director of whatever it is and they got to be executive director not because they care the most about puppies in the world but because they're really good at knowing everybody in town and so when you connect with an organization uh, that has one of those kinds of people one of those power people and they get to know you, they become a champion for you and start you know, sending you cases or sending you people who send you cases. And it helped. Also, kind of how do we educate, how do we use our marketing as a platform to educate? I mean, basically, you know, we have tried to do our best to memorialize a lot of our uh, 
trials and error and things that we've learned along the way in blog posts and frequently asked questions on the website. Aaron and I sometimes will sit down and do a podcast where we should do it more, but we've sat down where we'll just talk about what lessons that we've learned. Sometimes they'll have specific legal topics. Um, Aaron and I like to joke that if you ever catch us at a dinner party, there's a really good chance that you're going to end up getting an earful about how you should buy as much uninsured, underinsured motorist coverage as you possibly can. Make note of that. Everyone in this room, <laughs> buy as much uninsured, underinsured motorist coverage as you possibly can. And oftentimes, you know, we, we'll go on, we've got a really good working relationship with uh, a local show called We Are Austin, and we'll go on there like once every six weeks, once every couple months. And half the time, more, more than half the time, when we're not talking about puppies and charitable events and trying to promote the local charitable organizations with that time that we have, we'll go on there and we will do educational sessions. And a lot of times it is about uninsured, underinsured motorist coverage, which everyone in the room should buy as much uninsured, underinsured motorist coverage as I'll they can. Hold my mail carrier yeah. <laughs> so, you know, anytime that anyone's willing to give us an ear about, uh, you know, what we do, we try to make. Uh, the make use of it by by letting them walk away from the conversation knowing something that they didn't know before. Awesome. Anyway, two more questions? Yes. I, had, I had a question about, uh, we, get, we got told at least in one out pretty often, that we got told don't ever get emotionally invested in your client's case, you'll burn out really fast. But it seems all, forgive me if I, if I misread it, but it seems like y'all are saying the opposite, you've gotten advantages or something out of becoming deeply invested, I don't want to say deeply, but at least emotionally invested in your client's cases. Would you speak to that dichotomy? Yeah, I totally disagree with the idea that you shouldn't get emotionally invested. I think there are probably some boundaries you have to have, right? And that, that may be what that's about when they're teaching you that. I think maybe there's a, a different way to put it. Maybe investment isn't, isn't the right thing, but you should get emotionally connected because emotional force is what wins cases in court. I swear, if you don't think you have the personality to be a trial lawyer, but you can dig deep and connect to your person who's your client, uh, the jury will see through whatever prejudice they walked into that courtroom with and connect with you. And so that's a really important thing to my practice personally, and I know Josh feels the same way, uh, that you have to find the emotional force of your client's case. You have to find the moral high ground every single time because you can't win if you don't think you have the moral high ground, assuming you're in an adversarial lawyer job. But I, I, don't, I think that there is a lot of wisdom in advising attorneys not to get emotionally invested in their clients' cases in many areas of practice. I just don't think personal injury law is one of those areas of practice. I can understand, uh, you know, if you're dealing with a really, really nasty divorce case and your client's trying to drag you into the drama of that divorce case and you let those boundaries get out of control, that is going to be problematic and that is going to burn you out. I can also understand the same thing with you know, business disputes and criminal, some criminal cases, but there are areas of practice if you're doing uh, you know, nonprofit work um, that, that emotional investment to Aaron's point has to happen. I, I mean, <clears throat> we recently just finished handling a pro bono case for a 24-year-old young woman getting a double degree at Texas State University, walking across the street to go to class one morning and got hit by one of her professors and was a quadriplegic as a result of it. And she's coming to you and she's this beautiful light of human being with only a positive optimistic attitude and nothing that I can ever do will ever right that wrong ever. You can't not get emotionally invested when you're trying to help a person in a situation like that. So I think, I think it's, it's practice area specific. It's been my experience. I, and I've, I've pr done a lot of other practice areas. So in, in personal injury definitely is unique among them in that regard. It's a good question. Started your career, or was it kind of went into um, 
Yeah, so the question is basically, you know, how did we come to realize that, that the, there needed to be a perception change uh, as to what personal injury law is and how it should be practiced? And how did we realize we wanted to change it? Um, for, and I think we had different paths on that. Uh, for me personally, I had worked for eight years on the inside of insurance companies before going to law school. Um, and when I came out, I worked on the defense side. I defended cases in court for a, a major insurer that you've all heard of. And in that process, uh, came to see the issue. You know, this was very clear to me that there were some plaintiffs, personal injury lawyers, who were performing really admirably and doing great work for their clients. And they were unfortunately lumped in with the other group. And that the insurance companies, in their, for their part, they're reacting solely to the bad actors. So their entire posture is built around uh, a group of lawyers who probably don't practice the way you, you, know, you would want to practice. Um, and so observing that, uh, to me, it was just natural. It's like, OK, there is a right way to do this. Um, and navigate these waters for your clients. I mean, it's not just uh, fighting the insurance companies for their money. It's also helping a person figure out how to get to higher level specialists in order to figure out what's wrong with them, how to get the advanced imaging so that when they're 80 years old and they wake up and they still feel this pain, they know where it came from and they know that they got something for it, that it was included. Um, so understanding the insurance and the medical complex is something that, like when you're, you know, when you know something well, you just tend to analyze it and, and think, how do I optimize this? And that's kind of the way I approached it. Yeah, for me, I would say, you know, there's only so many times you can meet people at a dinner party and tell them what you do and be called an ambulance chaser before you're like, man, like something is wrong with this picture. Uh, but beyond that, really, um, you wouldn't believe how many times we get on the phone with people and they express guilt or remorse for picking up the phone and calling a lawyer for help with a personal injury case, sometimes massive injuries where they've, they're just tired of trying to handle it on their own and they're guilty and ashamed for picking up the phone and calling for legal representation even though the person that they're trying to work with at the insurance company's job is to pay them as little money as they possibly can to go away as quickly as they can before they've had an opportunity to fully evaluate the impact that injury is going to have on their lives. And you have that phone call over and over and over again and it's just, it's eye-opening and it makes you realize that something's got to change and I'm going to be a part of it if I can. Last question, and y'all can answer this kind of however you want to. So they're in law school. Some of them have a little bit of time. Some of them have a couple of years left. Advice in terms of skill sets that they should be working on, information, resources they should be gathering now while in law school, and then thinking forward, I guess answer that more just not immediately the next year or two, but thinking about the changes going on in society, changes in our legal profession, how do we need to be better preparing law students for that future so that they can have the same sort of meaningful satisfaction and pride in being a lawyer that, that you have? I would say as far as skill sets concerned, you know, Baylor does a great job of preparing its students for true in-court action. You're going to be way ahead of the curve on even knowing where to start preparing a motion or a response to a motion and getting ready for a hearing. I promise you that. So that's great and hone those skills and honestly take those opportunities that you're going to have here really, really seriously if you have any desire to litigate cases. Uh, it's not a joke. Uh, I, it, 
you are going to face situations in the real world that are going to be easier than the situations <laughs> that you face in practice court here and, and all, the, uh, all the, the mock trial stuff that you guys get to do. For me personally, working on my writing skills was a game changing for me. Working, getting, having the clerkship opportunity taught me the importance of writing and research. I got the unique opportunity to look, uh, look down on all of the work that had been done at the trial court level leading up to the point, all the motions that had been filed and argued and the court's rulings and the briefing that had all been done. So I got to see some really great writing and I got to see some really poor writing and I got to understand sort of, not that I was a judge, I wasn't, but I was writing memos to the judge about the salient issue, like important legal issues, and you, I came quickly to realize how good motion practice and good briefing can have a massive, massive impact on the outcome of a case. And so the way that I sort of approach that too is like, if I'm going to be tasked with writing a, a, a motion or a brief or a response, I'm going to become an expert in that topic and then I'm gonna learn how I can communicate it to somebody who might have no understanding or knowledge of that topic at all because judges are elected and a lot of them don't have a lot of experience in a lot of different areas of practice. So those things I think are, are, are good to focus on as you're preparing for this career. Yeah, so in, on the side of the advice part, I think it's important that you, you tap into something, and that is that lawyers are given a unique opportunity every time they wake up in the morning to, to do something special. Um, and when we talk about you know, this idea of lawyers staying up until two in the morning and working on some brief, you know, we think about, oh, that's, that's what a diligent lawyer looks like. That's what lawyers are supposed to do. Um, we don't really think about why they're doing it. Um, there are times when you wake up and you just go through your day and you say, well, tomorrow's the day I'm going to work and do this extra thing. But, you know, every single day you wake up and you have a law degree and you've, you've got a life, you've got a job, hopefully, um, you have an opportunity to do something really special. And every once in a while, for no reason whatsoever, you should stay up till 2 or 3 in the morning doing it. Um, make something magical happen. You have this amazing power to do something, and like I said, do something permanent. And by tapping into that, you can find that you're not complaining about it. And trust me, I'm not telling you to go into big law. Don't go work 80 or 90 hours a week and burn out and die. Like, I, I do not want that for you. I just want you to be able to have some respect for this thing you've got that's gonna be really special if you treasure it. Um, and as for the skill set changes, then some things will never change, right? Um, accountability, reliability, setting expectations. If you, if you approach your practice the right way, no matter what changes uh, happen, if you remain empathetic, if you listen to your clients, if you take them on your back and you know, take them up the mountain, whatever, wherever they need to go, uh, you will have a job and it will work. Uh, so I, I don't think there's gonna be any magical change, just, just focus on the basics. I would say though that technology has changed dramatically even in the practice of law with COVID. I know um, most of the people in this room are of a generation that's gonna be more technologically savvy than I ever will be, and you probably won't have any difficulties with that, but God, it changes so quickly. And it changes quickly even in, a, in, in arcane as a profession as the practice of law, and we watched it happen virtually overnight with COVID, with remote hearings and remote depositions. I mean, a sea change in the established practice of law. So trying to be an early adopter and keeping up with technology as it evolves so that you're not playing catch up when it matters is something probably always to have at the back of your mind. Wonderful, beautifully said. Okay, with that, we're going to end this part of the class. So if you will join me in thanking them for all the wisdom and tips and practical advice they've offered. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having us.